Turn to Psalm 24, and for our time participating in the Lord's table, we are going to get a unique glimpse at the Savior Jesus. This psalm includes a unique description of Christ not found in any other portion of your Bible. What in particular makes this passage unique is the repeated phrase that shows up at the end of this psalm, the king of glory, the king of glory. Nowhere else is this title given to Christ. The description as king, his description as glorious can certainly be found other places in your Bible, but these terms come together in this title uniquely here. And so I want to read this psalm and just highlight a few things that are marvelous truths, cherished truths to us who believe in Christ as Savior and as King. The psalm begins, a psalm of David. The earth is Yahweh's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend the, into the hill of Yahweh? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. This psalm presents none other than Jesus, who we know as Jesus, who is the Christ, in three different portraits, the first being found in verses 1 and 2. He's described as the sovereign Lord of creation. The earth is Yahweh's and all it contains. Everything that fills and everyone that fills the earth is included under his sovereign authority. He is the sovereign Lord of creation. He is the creator. Therefore, he maintains his rightful rule over all that exists. David here zooms in from the earth and what fills the earth, though. He zooms in to a particular place on planet earth, and he narrows his focus to a specific geographical location mentioned in verse 3. It is the hill of Yahweh. That is the, the hill he uniquely owns, has uniquely taken ownership of. And he asks the question, who can ascend? Who can stand in that holy place? This is a reference to Zion, uh, the city of Jerusalem, its primary or predominant feature being that mountain that made Jerusalem elevated above the places around it. God uniquely chose this place to make his name dwell there forever. Jerusalem maintains, it did in the Old Testament and the New Testament and now, a unique place in God's plan of redemption. If you were to trace out everything that God said from the beginning of your Bible, you would find very soon in the book of Moses, the first five books of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that God was 
seeking a place, a particular place to dwell among his people. And if you were to continue to trace out that promise, that place was not identified and located as Jerusalem until King David. David asks the question as the one who is the king who has the promises given to him for a seed to take his throne, to reign on his throne in his city. He has those promises. He asks the question, who has rights to this particular place, this holy place, this holy hill? And his answer to who has rights to ascend there, to dwell there, to stand in a permanent way there, his answers to who has rights to this holy hill is a holy people. Verses four through six describe this holy people. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, who has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The one who can lay rightful claim to this enduring kingdom to come in this city, on this hill, is the one who actually resembles in practical life the holiness of the place where God will dwell. In other words, the one who has rights to this holy hill is a holy person or a holy people. Even, he says in verse 6, the generation of those who seek him. Not only is David describing here the Christ, the coming Christ, as being the one who is the sovereign Lord of creation, but in these verses, he is the gracious God of seekers. The ones who humbly seek God, who live as God has instructed them to live, they are the ones who will receive a blessing from God, even the ultimate blessing of inheriting the kingdom to come on this holy hill. But he's not only stopping there. David, the king, is looking for another king. David is not the king of glory. David is in Jerusalem. He had dwelled in Jerusalem. He had rights to Jerusalem, and yet he looks for another king, a greater king, a better king. He is the king of glory. In verse 7 and following, David calls for the city to receive, not himself, but this coming king. Lift up your heads, O gates, verse 7, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king may, of glory may come in. He's calling for the city and its inhabitants to receive her king. He repeats this in verse 9, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Receive this king of glory. And then he answers the question twice after this repetition in verses 8 and 10 and answers the question, who is the king of glory? You might expect where the king has in a, in a description like this, attached his glory is to something like salvation, something like graciously saving his people. That's not exactly what's in focus, though. God's glory as king in this passage, in this psalm, in this description, is primarily attached to him making war Notice what's in view in verse 8, Yahweh strong and mighty, Yahweh mighty in battle. And then again in verse 10, Yahweh of hosts, or it could be translated Yahweh of armies is the word there. He is the king of glory. And what David has primarily in view is not 
the time in which we find ourselves and 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross, consumed God's wrath for his people so that they who believe would be rescued from God's judgment and inherit eternal life, inherit this kingdom to come. But what David does is he fast forwards past that all the way into the future, a time that still is future from us to when Jesus Christ himself will set up his kingdom on earth. And to do that, he will vanquish the world of all evildoers, all who are not a part of the generation of those who seek him will be removed from the earth so that God's people can dwell with God in peace, free from any terror or enemies or persecution. He will do war. He will do battle as a glorious king. And that really does beg the question for us this morning, what generation are you a part of? What group, to what group do you belong? Are you a part of the great of the seekers who seek him to whom God has been gracious or are you a part of the people against whom on whom God will do battle you can tell easily which group you're a part of simply by observing what's in verse 4 again he who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and who has not sworn deceitfully or Maybe even better translated, he who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. It's describing a holy life. What is characteristic of you, Christian? Those who claim to be God's people? Does holiness characterize your life? We read in the New Testament, in Hebrews, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That is true. And this morning, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, do you, is your life characterized by the holiness of those who will inherit God's kingdom? If it is not, repent. It's not, this isn't complicated. <laughs> Receive God's gracious invitation under his authority. If you do that, if you practice that as a regular pattern of life, we're not talking about perfection, but if you humbly accept God's authority in your life and pursue him, are seeking him, because you believe what he has said, <laughs> about the gospel, about a coming kingdom, about who you must be under his authority, then communion is for you. Take communion. You can rejoice as you remember this God, the sovereign Lord of creation, the gracious God of seekers, and the coming king of war. You can rejoice in all of those truths this morning if you have humbled yourself under the hand of God and the gospel. And if you have not, then this time is just not for you. Better than taking communion with God's people would be to reflect on what is preventing you from humbling yourself under this coming king of war. He is a coming king of war. All his promises are faithful, and he will do battle on all evildoers. You can escape the wrath to come by humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God before it is too late. And so I'm going to invite the men to come and serve us. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then take communion as you remember Christ and what he has done on your behalf. And I'll come back and I'll pray for us in a second.